Uncle. I must report to you that once again that I was in combat. I still will not transfer away, so perhaps you need to recommend some of your lieutenants for Major Soon. The combat was... well, it was different. Usually we can expect a surrender at some point. It was a massacre. I have never been more grateful that our ship is a Justicar, and not a Reeve or a Circuit. Those guys have to deal with this scorching garbage far too often. There are advantages to only ever fighting against large pirate groups, or competent criminal organisations, such as not obliging suicide cults. As I mentioned before, the toddler-sized biped does know what he's about as an officer, even though to me he seems to have the soul of a non-commissioned officer. There was a sense of wanting to do it myself over the tacnet. The interior of the Toronti ship was covered in webbing, which you might scoff at as they tend to only spin a small web in their living quarters, but not so. Additionally, there were carcasses of animals encased in sacks of webbing throughout the corridors, and some with the remains of... Well, let's say they had definite ideas on what to do with their sacrifices once they were dead. It was more or less routine. We waited for the defenders to cut down the initial boarding force and move through the docking chute to their airlock, and toss flashes before making entry. Unsurprisingly, the cultists didn't have armour, but Greg, or Sneaky as he's more often called, insisted that we go with both plasma and kinetic loadouts. I am unsure if this is a personal preference for redundancy, or a more general racial paranoia of the odd, tailless, scarcely fur lemur people. I suspect the latter, because he said something about better being safe than sorry, which had the cadence of an old saying, even if it had been translated in his mind first. The other interesting thing is that I did not have to explain how to set up a tactical network, only the actual use of our user interface, and only then at the points where I can see some ambiguity for a new user. He effortlessly set up an officer's channel for himself, a command channel for the three of us, and directed us to set up our squads with team channels for the junior non-commissioned officers. Importantly, he gave himself permission to break into any of the channels below his, which he used to inform team leaders of details, like an extra enemy hiding in a room, what looked like a possible explosive device, and signs of life in a victim in need of medical attention. It's clear that he's very used to picking details out of a big picture, and it saved more than one of our men. Omvia was an example of his physical combat ability, to be sure, but he was also in command of an ad hoc militia force. We are professionals, and so is he. When I tried to compare charts with him over how a military man operates, he was frustrated by his inability to translate some concepts into our language, and swore by what I think to be a deity that he would learn a civilian language as soon as he is able to finally be able to explain things properly. Such as his closest animal relative not being lemurs, apparently. I find this unlikely, but perhaps his world has a wider variety of certain animal types than the rest of the galaxy. Not uncommon for heavy worlds. The survivors were mostly intact. It seems that the cultists were working through them one at a time, so the longer it took to ritualistically torture someone to death, the longer it would take to get to the next victim. The stomach-turning thing is that they worked through the families in order to maximise the suffering of their sacrifices. A logical outgrowth of their worship of their idol of pain, but still but still disgusting. Speaking of disgusting, our quarry met these cultists, and he is the one who convinced these wackos to go from torturing animals to torturing people and murdering ships. Specifically our people. Specifically our ships. I know we're meant to take him in alive if possible, but I might kill him on sight. Worse, he took a child, the sister of one of the orphan survivors, as a slave. I told Sneaky about it, and he became so angry that the pale pink skin of his face flushed so darkly that it was almost purple. If this reaction to slavery or child abuse is common amongst his people, I think they will make fine allies indeed. He didn't think his duty was done once the civilians were rescued, however. He went and visited every last family with two of the children from this ship to ensure that they knew that they were in a place of safety once again. I had the immense privileges of witnessing one such interaction. A child of seven and another two years younger. The younger of the two was entertained and uplifted with his presence alone. Yet he still obliged her with shoulder rides and many, many spins, or the older was much more closed off. The tiny lemur thing sat with him and told him a story. A story of how he and his big brother used to love to go for walks under the trees of their home planet, and sing many, many songs. But one day, the consumptives came down. He lost his brother when an adult infected with one of those parasites stumbled across them and drove his host to consume. I 
can't even imagine going through something like that. But the child let down his guard and told about how his friend had been killed in the initial raid. The adorable little officer seemed to be able to tell the boy the right things about his experience. Or maybe it was just the pain that they shared in having lost someone important to violence. I highly recommend more of these tiny, not lemurs. If men like Sneaky are even somewhat rare among them, getting access to at least some of them would make our jobs not only far safer from how effective his command is, but the work to be done afterward would see great benefits. I hope he's considered ugly amongst his people, as if it is so, then they only get more adorable. Regards, Jawman.